storm chasers are looking for environments just like this, hopefully to find tornadoes like that one. They use the data they collect from those tornadoes for early warning detection systems, which could eventually save lives. The National Weather Service has issued a tornado watch for this region of western Nebraska. Now, Vortex 2 has been monitoring this supercell all day. They hope to get ahead of the storm and deploy their instruments right in the storm's path. They'll then use this information to help improve early warning detection systems. Before the snow starts falling and the ski traffic begins, there's another reason to drive up to the mountains, and that's to check out some of this aspen gold. Did you know the aspen's one of the most widely dispersed trees in North America? And since we've had one of the most driest summers on record, it's mid-September now that these trees are at their peak. I'm standing on the edge of where the trees burn from the Four Mile Canyon wildfire. Now it's eerie to think that it only took me 15 minutes to drive up here from downtown Boulder. And even though the fire was three weeks ago, it still smells like a bonfire up here and there's ashes falling from the tops of the trees. Four Mile Hero started as a Twitter group that tweeted news events while the fire was burning. Now they have their own website and volunteer agency. They've created this poster to help raise money for local firefighters. After an extremely dry summer, grasses and trees around Boulder County are like kindling. In September alone, we've only had three one-hundredths of an inch of rainfall. And it's because of this, the sheriff of Boulder County has issued a fire ban. Now, a violation of this ban results in a $500 fine. I'm here at the annual CSU Flower Trails Garden in Fort Collins, where even in late fall, these flowers are still in full bloom. There are 32 certified organic farms in Colorado. Now, to be able to say that they produce only organic fruit, orchards like this have to go through the Department of Agriculture. It's a $600 fee for a farm that's under five acres, plus the cost to have it inspected by a state official. But once they're certified, farmers are able to sell fruit that's guaranteed to be grown without pesticides or fertilizers. This is Ellie Collins reporting from Longmont, Colorado. In order for the cacti to survive, this room has to be kept extra dry and extra hot here at the Botanical Gardens. This middle school in Thornton had to cut almost their entire bus program which meant four to five hundred more students had to find other ways of getting to school. And without enough bike racks, students chain up their bikes to this fence, which is only 15 feet from an active railroad line. This is Ellie Collins reporting from Thornton, Colorado. The creation of this simple RNA molecule gives further support to what is called the RNA world hypothesis, where life on Earth was based on RNA rather than DNA as it is today. This RNA world may have led to the first life on Earth that underwent Darwinian evolution. Then it allows you to see how much water content was in that freshly fallen snow. Over the last 24 hours, we had 0.54 inches of water content in the snow. On the rain gauge here, you can see that's about halfway full. Imagine this outside your house. Would you have enough time to get to shelter? Early warning systems can alert people minutes at best before a tornado rips through town. When it comes to this monster, waiting for the sirens to go off may not cut it. The National Weather Service has issued a tornado watch for this region of western Nebraska. Now, Vortex 2 has been monitoring this supercell all day. They hope to get ahead of the storm and deploy their instruments right in the storm's path. They'll then use this information to help improve early warning detection systems. The CU team, in partnership with the University of Florida, joined with over 100 other scientists and 40 support vehicles in one of the largest and most ambitious efforts undertaken to understand tornadoes. I recognize, and I think all our team members recognize, how important this type of work is because without this kind of field research, there's really no way that we can improve the warnings that we get to the public and that's what this entire project is all about is ultimately saving lives and property and protecting people from these storms. Vortex 2 is a 10 million dollar effort to chase storms. The project is supported by the National Science Foundation and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and led by the National Severe Storms Laboratory. 
Participants include over a dozen universities, all looking for that perfect storm. I'm just gonna hope, like, I'm gonna take this out, you know, and move happens. everything left. Yeah. The CU team of mostly grad and doctoral students was led by Professor Katja Friedrich of the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences. Got it. Uh, this is a pretty good looking storm right here. At the moment, there's not really any strong rotation, but there's a lot of hail. Grad student Evan Kalina knows all about storms from textbooks. But this is the first time he's experienced this force of nature firsthand. The first time that we actually deployed on a storm was really the first time I had ever seen a supercell thunderstorm out here. And we were out here in this rural area up in Texas and there weren't any buildings or houses around so we weren't concerned that the storm was going to do any damage. And you could just watch as the rain progressed across the road and reached us and we got hailed on and it was just really incredible experience for me because I had never seen a thunderstorm like this before with so much open space around it. Each of the Vortex teams are assigned to collect data on certain parts of the storm. The CU's team's first priority was to measure precipitation. Their aim? To get in front of the storm and deploy instruments that measure rain and hail. Thunderstorms don't wait for anybody, and uh, we need to be pretty quick. Our team can deploy all our instruments, which are seven instruments in 10 minutes or less. Um, we just need to know where to put them, and we can get them there quickly. To get in the right position, the CU team has found themselves under the most intense part of the storm, sometimes going up against hail as big as baseballs. Our windshield has just been broken in three places by golf ball sized hail. We deployed in front of the core, but we couldn't get out in time because we're stuck behind the friggin' weather channel. We do have helmets. Uh, we haven't needed to use them yet, but we brought them on the trip and of course we all got our rain gear, favorite raincoat on uh, to keep us dry out there and uh, as safe as we can out in the elements. Let's go ahead to this morning. And this morning we've got uh, the big wave is further east. It is moving fast. The chase day usually starts off with a meeting led by the principal investigators. They discuss the likelihood of where and when storms will form that day. A location and route is then selected and each team rolls out. It might take a couple of hours or more to reach the target areas. But then the team might have to wait longer for the storms to start up. Most storms don't usually start until mid-afternoon or early evening, which gives the crews plenty of time to play ball or work on their tans. The funny thing about storm chasing is that it's a lot of rushing and waiting. So right now, I mean, we rush out of the hotel because we thought it's, it is early initiation. Go to your target area and then you sit and wait and sometimes you can sit for hours and then suddenly they say, okay, we have a target storm, and then you have to rush to the target storm. So it's either, either it's really, it's rushing or it's sitting down doing and waiting. But then it's off again. The game can turn dangerous fast when the storm chases the chasers. In early June, the CU team was caught in the storm's core in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. Taking shelter is the only option to avoid being pummeled with hailstones like this. Multiple tornadoes hit Scottsbluff that day. Although weak, the tornadoes did some damage. Luckily, no lives were lost. But storms can also be awe-inspiring. Once in a while, the teams might stumble upon picturesque views that are stunning. And after a successful deployment, 
Just sit and take in the sights, including some intense hail fog. The data they use during these six weeks will be used to better predict tornadoes. Studies like Project Vortex could lead to accurate warnings with lead times 30, 45 or 60 minutes. As the CU team's trek across Tornado Alley comes to a close, the research on precipitation will contribute to the overall improvement of understanding how tornadoes form. But before all that number crunching, there's still time for those wondrous sights. That is, the awesome form of nature. On a primitive Earth, the muck that we call the primordial soup is where chemical reactions would eventually create life. Flash forward some four billion years later. At CU's Porter Sciences, biologists are a step closer to finding out how these chemical reactions took place. And it seems that it could have been caused by something so simple and small. That was a surprise. So we actually engineered a tiny thing. Uh, an unexpectedly tiny thing. Nobody thought that this tiny thing, called a ribozyme, could have carried out the chemical reactions needed to synthesize proteins, the building blocks of life. Ribozymes are a form of RNA, or ribonucleic acid, ordinarily composed of hundreds or thousands of structural units called nucleotides. This one is only five nucleotides long, so this is much, much smaller than any of the other RNA enzymes that have been found either from life or that have been synthesized in the lab. They are seeing something that hasn't existed on Earth for four billion years with, might have be able to explain how life got started. The creation of this simple RNA molecule gives further support to what is called the RNA world hypothesis where life on Earth was based on RNA rather than DNA as it is today. This RNA world may have led to the first life on Earth that underwent Darwinian evolution. Nearly every cell of our bodies contains DNA, the molecule that carries genetic information from one generation to another. In the RNA world, this genetic information was stored in RNA molecules. So we work around that general idea that RNA, you know, did something pretty awesome, you know, back, back in the very early days of biological evolution. This tiny molecule is helping us take big steps towards our understanding of life's origins. Ellie Collins, News Team Boulder. Severe weather threatens most of the country today, from flooding in the northeast to critical wildfire conditions in the southern central plains. A slow-moving storm is expected to dump up to six inches of rain in parts of New Jersey, Connecticut and Rhode Island, and Massachusetts. The high winds and low relative humidity are expected to create wildfire conditions across New Mexico, Texas, and Oklahoma. Under the new health care overhaul, young adults buying their own insurance can expect to carry a heavier burden. Premiums for young people buying individual insurance can expect to see a 17% increase. That's roughly an extra $42 a month. The city of Boulder wants to lower speed limits again on Highway 36. Just last week, the Colorado Department of Transportation lowered the speeds on the stretch of 36 from 65 to 60 miles per hour. At the city council meeting tonight, they will propose lowering the speed limit between Baseline Road and Table Mesa Drive to 55 miles per hour. This shows us the moisture level. You see a lot of upper air disturbances from this system. Now this means a lot for the state of Colorado because yesterday we had severe fire danger warnings. Music